Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to the 10th annual CIFAR Symposium. And uh, this year, we're going to focus on HIV and TB and other co-infections of the South. Um, and this was a topic about uh, nine or 10 years ago as well as the CIFAR symposiums began. And indeed, uh, there's been a lot of progress in this area in terms of lives lost. Uh, in 2004, it was thought that approximately 500,000 people died a year from uh, HIV and TB. And uh, in 2012, the number had dropped to a be around in the 300,000 range. Still unacceptable, but uh, an improvement so that all of the efforts with prevention, treatment strategies, and uh, beginning to understand about biomarkers and uh, what's really happening in the setting of co-infection has been progressing. And so, um, so it's with that spirit that we're going to try to break new ground in this day and a half. We have a wonderful group of speakers from as far away as Africa and Europe and Asia, and we're really looking forward to everybody's contribution. And, um, and I just, again, just it, I'm always reminded of the fact that the first uh, un understanding that something terrible was happening in Africa in terms of uh, the HIV epidemic in the 80s was the observation by Jonathan Mann and then Zaire, or DRC, that TB had uh, accelerated very unexpectedly. And this was coincident with observations by Bill Papp in Haiti that the same thing was happening. So TB and HIV have been in what Stefan Kaufman calls a deadly liaison, uh, or a dance made in hell, a match made in hell, uh, from the beginning of the epidemic. And uh, we have a lot of work in front of us, standing on the achievements that everybody and many of the people in this room have already made. And I'd like to turn it over to Bruce Walker, and uh, the <coughs> director of the CIFAR at Harvard. Great. Thanks, Anne. Uh, well, I also just want to uh, make some very uh, quick uh, uh, welcoming comments to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Um, our CIFAR has been interested in this interaction between TB and HIV for quite some time, really dating back to one of the earlier CIFAR, CIFAR symposia that we did where we, where we focused on TB and HIV infection. Um, it's, it's clear that it's become, over the years, even, even more relevant and uh, I think uh, Anne and the other organizers have done a terrific job in terms of pulling people together for this. Um, our, our CIFAR is, um, is, uh, uh, has evolved to become a, a, a CIFAR that involves all of Harvard from a couple of smaller CIFARs that started at the hospitals here. Uh, and we're delighted that we just got funded again for another five years, so we hope to keep having a, an impact. So thanks, everybody, for, for coming. And I think we'll go ahead and get started then, right? So, so uh, the, the first session is on HIV, it's HIV and TB now. So Gail and I are the <laughs> moderators for this, so we'll walk over here. It's really my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Dick Chasen from Johns Hopkins. As we all know, Dick has made an unbelievable number of significant contributions in this field. And Dick, we are really anxious to hear what you have to tell us this morning. So I, you all have access to his bio, so I won't repeat his many accomplishments and contributions, but we're really glad that you agreed to come be with us this morning, Dick. Well, thanks very much. And thanks to Anne for the uh, kind invitation to join you and, and to Bruce. This is a homecoming uh, for me. Uh, I spent my childhood working in Kendall Square, right behind us here, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, lived, uh, grew up here, and uh, it's, it's nice to be able to come home. Uh, when I get to Logan, by the time I reach the, the curb, uh, my accent is back, but I, I do try to, try to regulate it, so uh, <coughs> I don't sound too native. Um, and I also am really pleased to be able to be here with the Harvard CIFAR because the Harvard CIFAR was so helpful to us at Hopkins when we reestablished a CIFAR that had uh, gone out of business and, uh, and Bruce was very generous in his advice. Uh, so uh, our CIFAR is back uh, in business and, uh, and 
we really appreciate the guidance we got from you. So anyway, I was asked to talk about the current uh, clinical uh, landscape of uh, TBHIV uh, in terms of uh, treatment and, and maybe identify some challenges and unanswered questions. Um, I'll make some uh, disclosures uh, here um, and start with uh, <coughs> the, uh, the global picture. Uh, I'm fortunate in being the first speaker and I don't have to worry about repeating anyone else's slides. Uh, but uh, this is the latest uh, WHO report uh, showing the estimates of the number of cases of uh, tuberculosis globally uh, with a very, uh, very modest uh, 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 decline over the past uh, several years of both uh, TB generally and HIV-related TB, but HIV-related TB still uh, constitutes about 15 percent of all TB. Uh, globally, but it accounts for 25 percent of deaths from tuberculosis globally, and tuberculosis remains the leading cause of death in people uh, with uh, HIV. Uh, one of the things that is uh, uh, <coughs> apparent and uh, a huge challenge is the fact that there are three million people a year with tuberculosis who are not properly diagnosed and treated. Uh, so out of the eight plus million cases of TB, three million are actually not uh, properly uh, cared for. Uh, and many of those are, are undiagnosed. And that led to this year's World TB Day theme earlier this week of finding the three million, uh, reach the three million uh, uh, and get them diagnosed and treated. And I thought I would uh, show a really uh, dramatic example of this problem uh, with a study that my colleague uh, Neil Martinson uh, at the Perinatal HIV Research Unit in Soweto did in uh, Clarksdorp, South Africa, uh, a couple of hours west of Johannesburg. And this was a study where he sent a team uh, to mortuaries to identify people who died at home uh, of nonviolent causes uh, without a diagnosis. And these were people who died in their death certificate said they died of natural causes. Uh, they hadn't seen a doctor or been to a hospital in at least three months, uh, and their cause of death was listed as unknown natural causes. And his team uh, got consent from the family of the decedents to perform bilateral axillary true cut lung biopsies uh, and a modified uh, 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 subthyroid uh, bronchoalveolar lavage. Uh, and sent this uh, uh, for evaluation on histology staining and uh, uh, gene expert, midget culture, uh, and, and other diagnostics. This is a hard study to do. They were able to identify 85 adults who died at home with no known cause, and of those, uh, a third were diagnosed with tuberculosis on at least uh, one laboratory test, and the biopsy uh, identified um, about uh, 20 of the, uh, of the 29, uh, and the BAL identified uh, 20 of them as well. Uh, so a third of people dying uh, at home in South Africa, which constitutes 25 percent of all deaths in South Africa, die of tuberculosis. And these cases are not detected. They're not reported. They're, these are people dying of tuberculosis. Uh, and nobody ever knew about it. So this is an enormous problem, and it's likely that the estimates of tuberculosis mortality in South Africa and tuberculosis incidence are vastly underestimated. So <clears throat> moving on to the treatment of TB, which is what I was actually asked to speak about, um, I, I just summarized sort of the state of the art uh, and uh, identify the areas that I'd like to touch upon. So standard treatment for HIV-related TB with INH, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol works uh, in patients with drug-susceptible TB, and it's the standard of care. No changes in the treatment regimen are recommended. Cotrimoxazole uh, treatment is recommended uh, in places outside of uh, uh, the developed world uh, as adjuvant therapy. And it's clear that all patients should receive antiretroviral therapy within two weeks if their CD4 count is under 50, and within about eight weeks if it's above 50. And the major challenges right now are how to manage that antiretroviral therapy, how to deal with drug-drug interactions. Now, other important issues that I'm not going to address because others will are immune uh, reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, uh, the diagnosis and management of children, 
and MDR and XDR TV, but the <coughs> uh, program has plenty of discussion of those topics, so I'm not going to uh, address them. So <coughs> the major questions are, when should we give antiretroviral therapy? What antiretroviral therapy should we give? Can we come up with better therapies for uh, tuberculosis, HIV-related or not? Uh, and what can we do to prevent uh, tuberculosis, particularly HIV-related TB? So <clears throat> I think it's very familiar to this uh, audience uh, where we've come in the last five years uh, with the timing of antiretroviral therapy uh, in patients with HIV-related TB. And so this was the first foray into this question, the SAPIT study uh, from Durban, which <clears throat> looked at initially uh, delayed therapy for uh, HIV in patients with TB, that is waiting until they completed their TB therapy, so six months or later, and that's the sequential group, or beginning antiretroviral therapy during uh, TB therapy, either within two or eight weeks, and that's the integrated therapy group, and it was quite clear that there was a major survival uh, benefit to starting therapy earlier. And what's most striking is this benefit uh, uh, persisted and actually grew months and months after tuberculosis therapy was completed. So this was a long-term impact of earlier antiretroviral therapy, not something that was only evident in the acute phase. Uh, next came the Camellia uh, study, which Anne obviously was uh, instrumental in and leading, uh, showing that in Cambodian patients with TB and HIV and very low CD4 counts, uh, earlier ART as defined as uh, within two weeks led to a 34 percent reduction in death compared to later ART defined as beginning uh, at eight weeks. And then two subsequent uh, reports uh, from the ACTG STRIDE study and the SAPIT study uh, also showed a benefit, particularly in patients with CD4 counts uh, less than 50, uh, to beginning uh, antiretroviral therapy within two weeks. Now, the STRIDE and SAPIT studies uh, <coughs> um, showed a uh, reduction in the composite endpoint of progression of HIV uh, to a new AIDS diagnosis or death, whereas the Camellia study uh, showed that effect with death. Um, so these clearly uh, established the guidelines for how HIV-related TB should be treated with respect to antiretroviral therapy. Now, we asked the question, is this early antiretroviral therapy something that's specific to tuberculosis, or is it just early antiretroviral therapy? And Chris Hoffman from uh, Hopkins looked at this in two cohorts of uh, patients with HIV in South Africa who didn't have TB, and he looked at uh, those who had their ART delayed uh, versus those who started uh, immediately and uh, <coughs> developed a mathematical model to predict uh, the impact of delay. And if you look, I don't know if I dare press a button because I might turn this off, so see if I can use the, uh, the uh, mouse here. If you look at a CD4 count of 50, immediate ART uh, uh, at that uh, CD4 count is associated with a risk of, uh, oh, thank you so much, a risk of uh, death that is uh, in the 15% range. If you delay therapy for just uh, 10 weeks, as was done in the Camellia and Sapit studies, more or less, uh, you increase your mortality uh, substantially to 25 to 30 percent. And overall, if you take a CD4 count of 150, a 10-week delay in antiretroviral therapy is associated with a 31 percent increase in mortality. Now, it's clear then that uh, timing of ART is important for survival, and this is independent of tuberculosis, and it's likely, and we'll probably hear a lot more about this later, that tuberculosis makes this even uh, worse um, uh, through uh, uh, increased uh, viral loads and suppression of CD4 counts. So the recommended approach is to begin early, within two weeks for patients with low CD4 counts, and uh, 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 within eight weeks for patients with CD4 counts uh, above uh, 50. And the exception to this is TB meningitis, where early antiretroviral therapy is associated with sometimes uh, fatal uh, 
uh, immune reconstitution uh, syndrome, which uh, Graham Menkes will talk about later. So what are the options for treating HIV-related TB? Well, <clears throat> the standard of care and recommended by the CDC and multiple other uh, agencies is an efavirenz-based uh, regimen where rifampin is used in the uh, TB regimen. According to the CDC, no dose adjustments of uh, the efavirenz are needed, but according to the FDA, uh, the efavirenz dose should be increased 800 milligrams <coughs> uh, for patients weighing more than 60 uh, kilograms, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. There are other <coughs> options as well for patients uh, who need to be treated with a protease inhibitor, uh, rifibutin can be used. Uh, and there's now some um, amassing evidence that raltegravir can be safely used and likely a dol uh, dolutegravir uh, and uh, even uh, potentially nivirapine. This question of the <coughs> interaction of rifampin and efavirenz is one that's been uh, uh, perplexing for uh, a number of years. And healthy volunteer studies showed that the interaction of these drugs led to about a 30 to 40 percent decrease in exposure to efavirenz uh, when rifampin was co-administered. And on the basis of a couple of very small uh, healthy volunteer studies, the FDA uh, changed the package uh, label for efavirenz to recommend this increase in dose. Um, <clears throat> In clinical practice, however, there's no evidence that there is an important interaction and that it has any clinical consequences if and when it does occur. And these are data from the ACTG STRIDE study uh, looking <coughs> at uh, uh, trough con concentrations of efavirenz in patients uh, with and uh, without rifampin uh, on board. And what you can see is that uh, actually uh, during treatment to, with rifampin in the solid bars here, um, uh, the trough concentrations were actually higher uh, than they were in pa uh, the patients who were no <coughs> longer uh, receiving uh, rifampin, and this was true across the board regardless of weight. And uh, uh, recently uh, uh, published uh, by this group uh, are data showing that uh, viral suppression was not affected by this and was not associated with weight. In fact, uh, the patients who weighed uh, more getting a standard dose of efavirenz uh, had significantly higher uh, viral suppression. Uh, but this is unlikely related to any drug interaction. Uh, this is just demonstration that efavirenz works in the setting of tuberculosis therapy. Now, <clears throat> perhaps the reason that there was this uh, concern, and the healthy volunteer study showed us something different, is that uh, <clears throat> we know that uh, efavirenz is metabolized primarily by CYP2B6 uh, isoenzymes, but there is uh, a, another uh, pathway, a minor pathway, the CYP2A6, uh, <clears throat> which metabolizes efavirenz, but this is the major pathway, and we know that this pathway is upregulated uh, by rifampin. What has recently become appreciated, however, is that when isoniazid is given, it inhibits the uh, CYP2A6 uh, pathway and therefore increases exposures to uh, uh, efavirenz. Uh, in fact, uh, in individuals who rely on this pathway, isoniazid essentially obliterates it, uh, and so this compensates for any rifampin-based um, uh, effect on efavirenz. So this is something that we've been looking at in a cohort of pregnant women with and without tuberculosis, all of whom are HIV infected uh, in South Africa. And we looked at their <coughs> genotype for the CYP2B6 uh, 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 isoenzyme, and these are divided into four categories, extensive metabolizers, fast metabolizers. So these are uh, people <coughs> who uh, metabolize uh, efavirenz quickly, intermediate, slow, and then there are a few who are very slow. Uh, and for the rapid metabolizers, inhibition of the uh, uh, alternative pathway by isoniazid has no effect because they have uh, rapid metabolism with uh, uh, the um, CYP2B6 and it's upregulated uh, and uh, isoniazid doesn't matter. But as you get into the intermediate and slow metabolizers, inhibition of that um, uh, <coughs> uh, 
alternative path by isoniazid leads to significant increases in exposure to um, efavirenz. So when we treat people for TB and HIV, we treat them with multidrug therapy. We don't just give them is isolated rifampin and efavirenz. And in the setting of multidrug therapy, uh, in fact, there is, if anything, a paradoxical effect of tuberculosis co-treatment on efavirenz exposures. And that's uh, shown here. Uh, <clears throat> for these pregnant women with, with and without um, uh, tuberculosis, uh, the trough, median trough concentration was about 1.6 if they were on no TB drugs. For those who were on INH only, it was actually uh, slightly higher, uh, and a slightly smaller proportion had what is considered a subtherapeutic uh, trough concentration. Uh, if they were on INH and rifampin, in fact, the uh, trough concentrations, the medians, were much higher, significantly higher, but they were much more heterogeneous and variable, representing that spectrum of uh, efavirenz metabolism, metabolism static status. And so 27% had subtherapeutic uh, concentrations, even though the median was actually higher than for people not on um, uh, TB drugs. Now the good news is there was absolutely no impact on viral suppression or transmission of HIV to infants. Um, so these uh, subtherapeutic concentrations uh, defined as they have been traditionally defined pharmacologically were not pharmacodynamically subtherapeutic. What was interesting to us, however, was that pregnancy was an important um, predictor of efavirenz exposure, uh, and efavirenz has become the drug of choice for treatment of women who are pregnant and have HIV uh, <clears throat> as part of the B-plus uh, option. And uh, there, the trough concentrations during pregnancy are significantly lower uh, than postpartum, and the proportion who have the so-called subtherapeutic concentrations are significantly higher. Now, this is probably important for one reason, at least, which is that there is a move now uh, by the World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation, uh, and others interested in this uh, to establishing a lower dose of efavirenz uh, to cut the cost of the drug, and a 400 milligram dose has been shown in a clinical trial to be equivalent to a 600 milligram dose. And if you can reduce the dose by a third, you can save a lot of money in manufacturing the drug and treat more patients. But this is a setting uh, where doing that would probably be hazardous, and you wouldn't want to expose <coughs> pregnant women to what could be very uh, subtherapeutic concentrations. I want to talk about how we can improve the TB treatment. <clears throat> there are a number of drugs that are uh, under development uh, for tuberculosis in phase two and phase three. <coughs> What's somewhat disappointing and frightening is that the uh, middle of the pipeline here is not very uh, full, but the uh, end of the pipeline uh, has a number of uh, interesting and exciting products and two that have been approved in the last uh, year and a half. Uh, for the treatment of multidrug resistant TB. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, new drugs for TB and how we're uh, approaching them and what some of the more recent uh, uh, outcomes have been. So just to <coughs> put this into uh, uh, context in terms of how the development process works, obviously there's a lot of preclinical work required to identify new products that might be useful for the treatment of tuberculosis. But <clears throat> where we come into this usually uh, is at step three, which is the evaluation of these agents or regimens uh, in animal models that are predictive of outcomes in humans. And right now, the best animal model that predicts outcomes in humans is the mouse model. It's not a perfect model, but it is a model. Uh, and there are other models that are being looked at, such as non-human primates, uh, guinea pigs, rabbits. But right now, the mouse is most faithful to what happens when we treat humans. Uh, and so these regimens or drugs are evaluated in a mouse model, uh, and if the results are promising, indicating that you can shorten tuberculosis therapy uh, using uh, these new regimens, then we move to human trials. And the phase one and two trials use surrogate endpoints, uh, <coughs> such as the early bactericidal activity, EBA, the eight-week uh, sputum uh, conversion rate, or the time to positivity in midget, uh, which is a surrogate marker for uh, sputum uh, conversion. Uh, 
And only after satisfying these surrogate endpoints do we go to phase three clinical trials looking at clinical endpoints. And the reason is that these trials are hugely expensive, take a long time, are very difficult to conduct. And these trials are nightmarishly large and take a very long time and cost tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars to do. And you don't want to go and do a phase three study because <laughs> you found in a uh, <coughs> laboratory uh, test that a compound killed TB. You really have to have uh, much better compelling <coughs> evidence that uh, this will work uh, in humans. So some of these phase two studies that have led to uh, where we are today are uh, shown here. So the Oflotub study uh, in South Africa looked at adding a fluoroquinolone, uh, gadifloxacin, moxifloxacin, or ofloxacin, uh, to the standard regimen and showed that over two months, both the gadifloxacin and moxifloxacin uh, regimens killed mycobacteria in the sputum of these patients uh, better than ofloxacin or a control regimen that included only a thambutol, uh, or, or the fourth drug was a thambutol. And a study that we did in Brazil uh, likewise showed that when you substituted moxifloxacin for a thambutol, uh, you had significantly greater culture conversion by uh, two months, about a 20% difference in the proportion of patients who had negative cultures. Now, historically, a 20% uh, difference in culture conversion at two months has been associated with a reduction in the duration of therapy by uh, 30 to 50%. If you look at uh, the examples of adding rifampin, uh, when it first became available, we reduced the therapy by 50%. When we added pyrazinamide, uh, reduced it by 33%, uh, uh, the duration of treatment. And these are drugs that increase sputum conversion at two months by the order of 15 to 20%. So these are very exciting findings. Now, there were other studies that didn't find this difference. Uh, but on the basis of the data from the, uh, the two studies that uh, uh, clearly documented this, two phase three uh, studies uh, have been done. The first was the Oflotub II study, and this was a randomized uh, uh, double-blind non-inferiority tri trial looking at uh, gadifloxacin uh, uh, given for four months of therapy versus um, uh, control given for six uh, months. And the results uh, preliminarily were presented in November at the International Union Against TB meeting and uh, show uh, disappointingly that gadifloxacin was not non-inferior. Now, that doesn't mean that gadifloxacin is inferior, it's just not non-inferior. Uh, <coughs> and um, Michael Hughes is here and he'll explain that to you later. Um, but this was a disappointing result. Uh, in the phase two trial, gadifloxacin had similar activity uh, to moxifloxacin, but in the mouse model, it doesn't. It's not as potent. So maybe it was the wrong drug. Uh, there are other issues with that trial that make the interpretation difficult. The Remox TB trial is a randomized double blind non inferiority trial of two regimens, including moxifloxacin given for four months compared to control. And the results are coming out any day now. Um, uh, this is a, a study done by the uh, uh, TB Alliance, and the results are in, and they will be out uh, shortly. Um, I'm not sure if they will come out in a scientific meeting or a press release, but uh, keep, keep your, uh, your ears tuned uh, uh, for these results. Now, <clears throat> another uh, approach uh, is improving therapy with rifamycins. And uh, a lot of attention now focused on rifapentine, which is essentially rifampin, um, but its half-life is uh, much longer, uh, 10 to 15 hours versus two to three hours, and it's fourfold more potent against mycobacterium tuberculosis. So if you have the drug and you keep it around longer and uh, it's four times more potent, uh, it, the mouse model shows that it is better at sterilizing and curing uh, animals, and so there have been a number of studies uh, in uh, humans. This is the TB Trials Consortium Study 29X uh, presented uh, last year that looked at three doses of rifapentine versus the standard dose of rifampin, rifampin so 10, 15, and 20 uh, milligrams per kilogram, and showed that at eight weeks, 
uh, killing, uh, sterilization of the sputum, conversion of the sputum, uh, occurred in essentially 100% of those who were treated with the high dose uh, and uh, very significantly uh, higher uh, uh, percentages for those treated with any dose of rifapentine compared uh, to rifampin. So these are very important uh, differences in the eight-week culture conversion rate and therefore very promising for treatment uh, shortening. More recently, <coughs> Susan Dorman presented at CROI uh, earlier this month here in Boston the results of the RIOMAR study, which was a study <coughs> that began quite some time ago before we knew as much as we did about rifapentine dosing. So it used a low dose of rifapentine but added moxifloxacin. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> in this uh, study, there was no difference uh, in uh, time to culture conversion on the solid medium, but in liquid uh, medium, there was significantly faster culture conversion. And if you look at the eight-week point, there was about a 20% increase in culture conversion uh, with the uh, rifapentine pyrazinamide uh, moxi regimen. Uh, and so, again, a very important uh, uh, increase in sterilization. And this was with low-dose uh, rifapentine. So uh, <coughs> hopefully with high-dose rifapentine and moxifloxacin, there'll be uh, superior sterilization and cure. And a study to look at that is in development now with the TB Trials Consortium and the ACTG. There are other <coughs> interesting and novel uh, uh, drugs, uh, and I won't go through all of them, but I will highlight uh, one new combination from the TB Alliance which is uh, PA824, a nitroimidazole, uh, moxifloxacin, and pyrazinamide. So no INH, no rifamycin. Uh, and in this 14-day early bactericidal activity uh, study, this is in patients looking at the concentration of bacilli in the sputum over two weeks, this PAMZ uh, regimen was hugely superior to a four-drug control regimen of INH, rifamp, and PZA ethambutol, and better than a number of other experimental uh, uh, regimens, including uh, bedactylin uh, uh, shown here, which doesn't really do much for a week or so until concentrations are increased. So a phase two, eight-week study of this regimen was done and showed that it was superior to uh, the standard of care. That has not yet been uh, publicly presented, but it is known. Uh, and a phase three trial of tr shortening treatment to four months using this regimen is uh, in planning with the TB Alliance uh, right now. So uh, <clears throat> we have several phase three uh, treatment shortening studies coming along. I want to move now to prevention of tuberculosis, even though that wasn't specifically what I was asked uh, to talk about, but uh, it is related to drug therapy, so Ian is allowing me to do this. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think if we, if we look at the big picture, there are certainly multiple ways that we need to think about uh, preventing tuberculosis, beginning with preventing the initial infection, and Ed Nardell will talk about that uh, later. Uh, treating HIV is extremely important. Uh, re re <coughs> treatment uh, of uh, HIV with antiretroviral therapy reduces tuberculosis risk by 50 percent, uh, and that's been shown now in multiple cohort studies. But the HPTN-052 study um, which treated discordant couples, uh, treating uh, an infected partner with heart or deferring heart, showed a 50 percent reduction in the risk of tuberculosis in those who were treated early versus those who had delayed treatment. So it's clear that antiretroviral therapy is essential. But I want to talk a little bit about chemoprophylaxis, uh, preventive therapy for tuberculosis, because this is something that uh, both clearly works but clearly has some challenges. Um, so <clears throat> it's been known for a long time that uh, isoniazid uh, preventive therapy for people with HIV is effective. There have been several, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, over a dozen uh, controlled clinical trials. It's particularly uh, effective in those who are TST positive, less so in TST negatives. Uh, but it's clearly been shown in multiple studies to be effective. The uptake has been terrible. And these are data from the World Health Organization looking at the uptake of INH prevented therapy in people with HIV. Uh, and you can see that the numbers have grown gratifyingly from 2004 to 2011, but this represents a tiny fraction of the proportion of people who should have been treated with INH. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> that number should be in the 20 million range, and it's nowhere near that. So uptake has been uh, terrible. Um, so to improve uptake, uh, we uh, undertook a study in Brazil that uh, <clears throat> was called the TRIO study, where we just tried to get HIV clinics to do what they're supposed to do according to Brazilian guidelines and did a training intervention in a step wedge study, randomized the clinics to the order of the intervention uh, where they were trained to give INH preventive therapy and then <coughs> um, compared the risk of TB in the pre-intervention and the post-intervention period at the clinic level. So we didn't ask the question, does INH work for people with HIV, because we knew it did. We asked the question, if you do this at a clinic level, will it reduce TB at the clinic level across the board? We were able to show that uh, by doing this simple intervention of training, uh, the tuberculin testing rates uh, increased dramatically, although you can see that, you know, going out towards three years, there are still uh, 20 plus percent of patients who should have had a tuberculin test who don't get it. Uh, and then the uh, initiation of INH preventive therapy for those who require it uh, increased dramatically as well. But again, the lag time you can see, you know, to reach 80% uh, of those who need it is almost uh, two years. The results, however, are, are gratifying, and if you look at the adjusted risk of tuberculosis based on uh, CD4 count, uh, ART use, age, and sex, uh, for TB alone, there is a 27 percent reduction in the risk of TB and a 31 percent reduction in the risk of TB or death. Uh, and in a per-protocol analysis, with what we call the stayers, the people who came to clinic at least once a year there was over 50% reduction in TB and 50% reduction in TB or death. So implementing INH preventive therapy actually works. Uh, now the other question we had is, would this be durable? If you gave INH preventive therapy, would it last? Um, and the answer is, in Brazil, yes. The uh, effect was durable, and if you look overall, you can see that uh, after starting, there were no cases during INH preventive therapy, but going out to five years, uh, very low rates of TB, no evidence of escalation of risk, uh, and most of the risk was in people who didn't actually complete their INH preventive therapy for six months. Now, <clears throat> another way to improve uptake is to simplify the regimens and use more potent regimens, and this was the TBTC study 26, or the Prevent TB study, that uh, <clears throat> looked at um, an experimental regimen of three months of rifapentine and isoniazid given once a week, 12 doses of rifapentine and INH uh, <clears throat> given weekly versus nine months of INH. And this shows that uh, the uh, rifapentine INH uh, regimen was almost superior. This was a non-inferiority trial. It was clearly uh, non-inferior, but it was almost superior, the p-value of 0.06. Um, so a simple 12-week regimen of rifapentine and INH is at least as good and probably better than nine months of INH for prevention of TB. Now this was in a population that was largely HIV negative, um, and so <clears throat> the AIDS clinical trials group joined with the TBTC to recruit an additional group of HIV-infected patients, and those results were shown uh, at CROI again earlier this month uh, by Tim Sterling showing that the uh, rifapentine INH regimen um, was, uh, was actually superior. This line should then just go straight across. Um, that's the end of the business here, uh, whereas the INH treated patients had continued uh, cases of TB that occurred. So in HIV-infected patients, this regimen uh, is at least as good and probably better uh, than uh, INH. Now, <clears throat> on the other side is this study just published in January from the CREATE Consortium um, uh, by Gavin Churchyard and, and colleagues, uh, the Tabella TB study. And this was a study that looked at mass INH preventive therapy in gold miners in South Africa. Now, this was a very challenging study, very large, 78,000 miners participated, uh, and it sought to uh, recapitulate the experience in Alaska in the 1950s that George Comstock uh, uh, led, uh, showing that community-wide INH preventive therapy reduced tuberculosis incidence overall by 30 percent in the entire community. Um, <clears throat> in the um, Tabella TB study, uh, 
in the intervention mines where mass INH preventive therapy uh, was offered, the TB rate in the year following this was 3%, and for the control group, it was essentially 3%. The unadjusted hazard ratio was 1.00, so it doesn't get any more perfect than that, uh, adjusted 0.96. It did not work. Mass preventive therapy in the mines did not work. Now, <clears throat> this is in a setting where about 35 to 40 percent of the miners are HIV infected. A large proportion have silicosis. They live in congregate living facilities, uh, and uh, they work underground um, uh, in, in a dusty environment. Um, so this is not a clinical trial in HIV infected people. This is in a very high risk population, and it didn't work. So why didn't it work? Well, it turns out it did work while you took it. So during uh, the nine months that INH was given, the incidence of TB in those who took it was a little over 1% versus about 3% in the control arm. But as soon as the uh, treatment was stopped, uh, these lines reconverged. Uh, and this indicates one of two things, either that um, Transmission is occurring, and transmission is occurring at a very high rate, leading to uh, primary disease, um, and or that in the setting where many people have silicosis in addition to HIV, isoniazid isn't sterilizing, and it suppresses TB infection, but it doesn't uh, eliminate it, and when uh, it's stopped, like a microbicide, um, there's no further protection. Um, so this is uh, clearly uh, an important issue that needs to be grappled with. But this is also consistent with the study from Taraz Samandri and <coughs> his colleagues from the CDC in Botswana that looked at long-term INH um, in uh, patients with HIV and showed that uh, continuous INH for three years uh, was associated with a significant protection against TB in the TST positive individuals uh, shown here and here. No additional benefit in the TST negative individuals. So in individuals with latent TB, uh, long-term INH preventive therapy in Botswana was better than short-term. And in a study that we did in Soweto, <coughs> we likewise found that long-term INH, in our case up to six years, was associated with protection from TB so long as you took it. This is our as-treated analysis. This is the uh, intent to treat. Many patients went off of their INH, um, and when they did, their risk returned um, to uh, that of those who had shorter regimens, including rifapentine-based regimens, uh, weekly rifapentine-based regimens. Again, this raises the question of, uh, is this uh, reinfection or is this uh, lack of sterilization from, from isoniazid in this setting? And the, the reason that uh, lack of sterilization has any credibility is that the rates of TB in those who are on INH and stop it accelerate quickly as if something was being suppressed, as opposed to continuing at a steady rate as you would see with reinfection. So I think both, uh, both mechanisms are possible and uh, it's important to find out uh, if that's the case. Now, most recently, a study from Lele Rangaka and Gary Martins and colleagues in Cape Town uh, showed that in patients with advanced <coughs> HIV who are on antiretroviral therapy, isoniazid uh, reduced the risk of TB by about 50 percent. And what was very important in this study is that uh, this benefit was seen in tuberculin negative patients as well as uh, patients who had a positive IGRA. The tuberculin positive patients actually uh, uh, only had a modest decrease. The tuberculin negative patients had a more than 50 percent decrease in risk. It appears that the benefit may be waning when you get out to three to four years, but there's clearly a significant protection from INH in this setting in the Western Cape where rates of reinfection are known to be uh, high. Uh, <clears throat> so where things are headed now, at least uh, in the short run, is uh, an ACTG study that is looking at um, a, an ultra-short sterilizing regimen of daily uh, rifapentine and INH for one month, 30 days, versus nine months of uh, INH. Uh, and this is a study that is uh, uh, underway, has enrolled about 1,600 of the 3,000 patients, and will help uh, answer the question of whether more sterilizing potent regimens, even if they're of short duration, 
uh, will be uh, effective in uh, patients uh, with HIV, particularly those living in high burden uh, areas. So I'll just end with uh, what I think are the major questions, and they're framed broadly enough that everyone can help answer them. Uh, how can we better detect the patients who have active TB? How do we find the three million patients? In South Africa, GeneXpert has been rolled out, uh, but it's reaching patients who already come for care. Uh, so it hasn't increased the uh, number of patients diagnosed with TB. Um, how do you find the patients who die at home of TB who never come to the doctor? That's a huge uh, challenge. Uh, how do we treat TB better and have shorter and more potent regimens? And then how do we uh, prevent TB better? How do we have durable regimens that protect people in high burden areas, sterilizing regimens uh, that will be of lasting uh, benefit? So with that, I'll, I'll, <coughs> I'll end and I'll thank uh, the many colleagues and collaborators who provided uh, the data that I shared with you today uh, and uh, my funding agencies. Thank you. We have just a few minutes for questions. Um, Dick, I'd like to ask you one thing that um, bothers me, if it's real, is um, there are a couple of papers showing that a large percentage of the organisms present in sputum, even following treatment, are viable but non-cultivable. And I'm wondering if this is real in all of our EBA studies and evaluation of new compounds, how much that's impacting outcome. And also, perhaps even with existing drugs, if this is real and we're not, you know, measuring that effect, what, are, what the consequences are. And then the other just quick thing is with respect to INH and your prophylaxis studies, what about development of resistance to INH and how common is that? And is this a concern? Let me answer that last one first because it's the easiest. <laughs> no. It's amazing. Uh, amazing. It hasn't happened. It's amazing. It hasn't been seen never been seen, it's amazing. and it's the thing that people worry about the most, yeah. but the U.S. Public Health Service enrolled over 100,000 people in controlled trials of INH preventive therapy, and there was amazing. essentially no INH resistance that, that emerged from that. The Tabella study, 24,000 minors yeah. received INH, no evidence for selection of resistance, just doesn't happen. It's amazing. Everybody worries about it. Um, as to the first question, you know, there are multiple populations of mycobacteria uh, in a person with disease. Uh, some of them are antibiotic tolerant. They're there, they're not resistant. They keep growing. You know, after eight weeks, you know, 20% yeah. of the patients have positive cultures, even though they're on effective therapy that will ultimately cure them. And they don't have resistance. They're just tolerant to the antibiotics. Um, and there are non-cultivable uh, mycobacteria that may be the persisters that lead to recurrence. So any one of these surrogate markers is a surrogate marker. Yeah. You, can't t you cannot tell from a 14-day study whether people will be cured. You can only tell whether the drugs mm -hmm. are killing mycobacteria. And that's why the phase three clinical outcome trials are so important. Mm -hmm. What you care about is whether people are cured. And if they are cured and they have non-cultivable mycobacteria in them, who cares? They're cured. We want them to be cured. Sarah? Um, so I was wondering if you could just um, speak a little bit about what you think is going to, it's going to be required to have a new regimen taken up in the field, and especially informed by your work on INH, where clearly you have uh, treatment that works, and it's been very hard to get widespread uptake. So when we're looking at these whole new first line regimens, what do you think is going to be necessary to actually get those rolled out? So the question, for you back there, I don't think that microphone was on, uh, <laughs> is what will it take to get a new regimen for TB actually taken up and used, given the experience with INH? So I think you know, part of this is psychological and related to marketing. Um, if you compare um, uptake of new treatments for HIV, you know, you know raltegravir, that's passe. We got dolutegravir, you know. Um, people want the latest and greatest. Uh, and the WHO is following in step, you know, they want the latest and greatest. Um, so I think uh, some of it's psychological. There's resistance to change in the TB world. People learned what they learned 30 years ago in medical school and they don't want to change. And so that is a really important uh, issue. There are 
requires some kind of marketing. But in terms of uptake, I think practically it's got to be desirable. So that means it's got to be better. Uh, it's got to be easier. Uh, it's got to be less toxic. Um, right now, you see with Bedaclin being approved, you know, there's a great drug, except it's got a lot of problems and maybe associated with toxicity. The dosing is very difficult. It's half life is years. And, you know, it's not being snapped up because it's not very appealing. Um, and I think any new regimen has to really be appealing to patients and clinicians who are going to use it as well as to national programs who are going to be buying it. And that's the other issue, of course, is cost. But I think <clears throat> even with cost, we see HIV regimens snapped up and TB regimens not so much. In examining your, if you hold it, like, yeah. In examining your drug regimens, have you paid attention to diabetes in these patients, and whether you see a, an increase in diabetes in, in combination with drug therapy? Well, <clears throat> and that's a particularly important issue for gadifloxacin because gadifloxacin is no longer sold in the world because it is associated with dysglycemias and diabetes. In the clinical trials. It didn't happen, but those were small studies. But we know that from using gadifloxacin more broadly in, in patients for other indications, it's associated with diabetes. But that wasn't seen in the studies, but gadifloxacin has no future. No one's making it anymore. Um, uh, diabetes is an important comorbidity, and so a lot of patients with TB in many places have diabetes, and diabetes contributes to their development of TB, and sometimes may contribute to their poor response to therapy, but that really hasn't been looked at so much in the clinical trials. Uh, Dr. Chasen, one of the major concerns in the field, especially in uh, under-resourced programs who have antiretroviral therapies uh, or rolling out ART, is the uh, adequate exclusion of active tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Many uh, clinicians cite that as one of their biggest fears with regards to large IPT campaigns, and I was wondering um, especially even in South Africa, there's good data that up to one in five people in rowing may have active TB. And there are many parts of the wor world where we don't necessarily have the tools or the capacity to do a good exclusion. Um, and wondering what is your message as this continues to be a new concern? Well, I would say that um, there's lots of evidence from these uh, both clinical trials and clinical studies of implementation of INH <coughs> that if you do a clinical screening, it's highly effective at ruling out TB, but it's not perfect. And some patients will be enrolled. And the experience both in trials and in uh, programs uh, is that those patients who are enrolled and put on INH and have TB become evident quickly and uh, get on proper treatment with multidrugs. And thus far, I haven't seen or heard of instances where that proved to be a problem and it led to, you know, uh, drug-resistant disease. Um, but good screening up front makes a huge difference. I think we'll have to move on. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh,